And it is 2 p.m., guys, and welcome to the philosophy chat. Right now, my guest is going to be. It is 2 p.m., guys. I need to welcome. turn off that echo. My yeah. guest is going to be Grant today, and uh, we're going to be doing the three topics, like I said earlier. Uh, we're going to go kind of explain them one by one. Uh, but in the meantime, if you want to introduce yourself real quick, Grant, uh, where you're studying and what you do and what your projects are. your love Yeah, of yeah. I'm a student of philosophy and PPE at the University of Michigan. Uh, I work primarily in political philosophy, but I also do like general history of philosophy. Uh, that's basically it. I'm big into Kant and, you know, analytic political philosophy. Yeah, and uh, as I recall, your your project right now is to do a, a sort of study in between Freud and Kant, right? So that's what we're going to be sort of talking about. Yeah, later. that's my, my big paper for this year. Right. Okay, so um, before we absolutely begin, let's see if, uh, are, are we both coming through, guys? Everyone in the chat room, if you could type yes, if we're both coming through, if you guys can hear Grant just fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think we're getting a yes, at least from Clem. Okay. So yeah, uh, I guess we could begin with the first topic, like I said, and that's um, sort of the end, or if you don't want to talk about the end, but just systematic philosophy and the the sort of problems that we uh, we went over last time when we talked with uh, Kenny actually on the on the uh, on our chat room. Um, so one of the things that he brought up back in the day is that philosophy at least at this point at least analytic philosophy is sort of destined to specialize in a lot of different types of areas because the idea of systematically creating a holistic philosophy seems to be a nearly bankrupt idea right there's no way that a person in this day and age can necessarily um, collectively make a meta-ethics and epistemology and ontology and all that and that we should sort of specialize in one direction instead. And I wanted to know what your thoughts on that are um, and yeah. whether you think that that idea is itself bankrupt. I mean, it sounds, yeah, it sounds like an empirical claim and it sounds like one that's easy to falsify because I can point to a history of philosophy in which people were system builders, successfully so. And if you want to say this day and age is somehow different, I don't know. Uh, why it would put systematic philosophy out of reach insofar as even today there are system builders. You know, I've met people who are pretty clearly walking around with this system in their head. Right, like Robert Brandom. If you've ever run into Robert Brandom, you can tell, you know, he has he has everything hanging together in his head and he does work in all of these different areas. I think uh even without that, right? Like you don't have to be in order to do systematic philosophy. You don't have to be building your own system, right? There's many people throughout the history of philosophy who have built systems. And to do systematic philosophy, you might take influence from one or many of those people. So it's not like you're starting afresh or throwing away the wisdom of other people's work, but you can take that on as your own. So, I mean, so what, oh, what was the type, what would be a type of critique that you have, I guess, at the people who think that that it might be possible, but generally a naive perspective. So you say it's an empirical view, but have you, I mean, do you think someone like Brandon's system or McDowell's system, since I think he's a fairly systematic philosopher, you think that those systems are sort of successful? Because I, I, I tend to think that they're fairly successful. I don't, I just don't know if they're as far reaching as someone like Hegel's or Aristotle's um, uh, philosophy. Yeah, I mean, they're certainly not as far-reaching as those, but they're still probably the most successful philosophers, at least in Anglo philosophy of the day. Right? I can't think of uh, any more successful philosophers than the ones who have precisely done that, tried to be systematic. And so what do you, what do you exactly think is... Um... I mean, do you see a problem, I guess, first of all, with non-systematic philosophy? Like, do you think... Yeah, that, I mean, yeah. I mean uh, there's some pretty obvious problems, right? Like, I think all that we need to accept the, the ideal of systematicity is an acceptance of 
principle of non-contradiction. And once we realize that, we realize that everything has to hang together if we want anything at all to work. And when we silo ourselves into these uh, academic quarters and work on only one area, we end up constructing projects that are completely incompatible with all these other commitments we must have in order to have that be, you know, have the condition for the possibility of that kind of project in general is forbidden by some other commitment in some other area which we must have. And we would find that out pretty quickly or pretty easily if we knew more about the context. Yeah, so before I continue, and I kind of I wanted to reply, uh, but just, just to answer your question since this is the topic and someone already seems to be confused of what a, necessarily a system is in philosophy, and I've already described it earlier, uh, but it just again, a holistic system is basically, or a systematic philosophy is generally um, a philosophy that's going to incorporate various types of subsets. So if you have a philosophy of nature, an epistemology, a phenomenology, if you have a meta-ethics, if you have all these various things working in an interconnected and in an interlocking um, whole, that is, it builds off of each, uh, builds off of itself, and it relates itself rationally. There's rational relations between all these systems. And that's what would be generally called the systematic philosophy. But in a lot of analytic practices, and a lot of analytic philosophy, and this probably occurs a lot in continental philosophy, is that you have a lot of freestanding topics. There'll be people who are just inv uh, invested in meta-ethics. So say someone like uh, Lundu Schaefer, or Schaefer Lundu, I can't ever remember which order it is, or uh, uh, Course Guard. Uh, these are people who are going to be investigating um, mostly theories of action and mostly meta-ethical questions, sometimes normative ethical questions. They're not going to be investigating other types of areas generally, or aren't too, too interested in investigating other areas. Um, so if there's generally an objection to these uh, systems, uh, let's say a metaphysical objection, uh, let's say you're a transcendental idealist of some sort, and you're arguing against people who are very specialized, like the meta-ethicists, or let's say that you're arguing against like someone doing fill of religion, and you have a Kantian dismissal of the principle of sufficient reason, they're not really going to care too much. They're going to care more about, you know, um, assuming certain types of qualifications from the get-go and then proceeding on to that. That's not to say that this always is the case. It just seems to be the case where I analyze things. Anyways, so Grant, um, so we had this conversation basically with Kenny a while back ago, and I guess a lot of people don't know it. And this was a sort of critique that Kenny gave to us is that systematic thinkers or studying the history of philosophy in general seems to not be something that a philosophy student needs to do. So it's not too terribly important if someone reads Aristotle, Spinoza, Kant, and that having the expectation that such that they should read all these people and these various thinkers is a sort of also an equally naive perspective. Um, why do we why should we care about what plato has to say or what descartes has to say or what kant has to say if we can just kind of throw these aside and not necessarily start anew but specialize in all these various areas and then really analyze them through syllogisms and contemporary arguments and so i remember your criticism being something like well it seems as though avoiding the historical thinkers um is a, this is a sort of problem that maybe we should have that there's a reason why they sort of withstanded history and why we keep referring back to them so you could tell me a little bit about that uh, i think that's right but i mean what i usually say when i mean we hear this a lot i think or at least i've heard this a lot this argument that we shouldn't care about the history of philosophy that we should should have moved on by now or something like that why are we talking about people from the 17th century etc cetera, etc cetera. um I think what we end up seeing when we take that attitude, and we've seen it in analytic philosophy probably a lot more than continental philosophy, if there is such a thing, uh, insofar as continental philosophers 
in general are much more historically minded, it seems. And what I think I see happening quite often is that we are ignorant of the history of philosophy, and so we end up reinventing the wheel. And the wheel just ends up being some uh, long debunked, thoroughly rebuked and criticized doctrine. And we haven't read the criticisms of them either because they were <laughs> given a long time ago and we don't care about a long time ago. So, you know, we end up trotting out, uh, we end up trotting out arguments or ideas that are broken and have been broken for a long time. And we don't know why they're broken because we haven't paid attention to criticisms of them. Um, and beyond this, I think more recently I read a paper from Sellers where Sellers says that the history of philosophy is a lingua franca, or a lingua franca, pardon, of, of philosophers in general of different traditions and different specializations. And that if we have a common or shared understanding of the history of philosophy, it makes it much easier to breach or bridge the divides that we have set up for ourselves. Uh, so I think that relates also to 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 a systematic project insofar as we can understand, relate to the claims of others if we have this shared context in which we're doing work, and that context is the history of philosophy. So, but what would you say to the, the, the type of criticism that I guess Kenny gave earlier about the sort of demand that people ought to study all these types of various thinkers? Do you think that philosophy students ought to study the history of philosophy? Or are we okay with just specialization? I think, I think that an overwhelming majority of the time, students of philosophy ought to study the history of philosophy. There are very, very few exceptions to this, right? Like, there are very few great philosophers who could get away with... I mean, the way in which the history of philosophy informs your work is, is absolutely crucial. Being ignorant of it is impedimental to your own work. But if you happen to have the genius of a Wittgenstein or something like that, then perhaps you are very ignorant of the history of philosophy. And Wittgenstein famously was, right? He was into like Kierkegaard or whatever, but even the Kierkegaard scholars of his era were saying, you know, his reading was a bunch of nonsense, et cetera. So there are very few, I think, of these geniuses who can do excellent work in philosophy without having engaged with the history of philosophy. But the rest of us, I think, probably need this, need to be informed, need to be able to grow wiser and stronger and smarter from the insights of the greatest thinkers of history. You know, one of the things that I've been kind of looking at whenever people sort of offer this criticism um, that we shouldn't really care about the history of philosophy or that we could just kind of do contemporary analytic philosophy or contemporary continental philosophy is that, you know, and then I read people like Kurskard or I read people um, like, you know, Landu Schaefer or whatever, or um, Ian Hamilton mm -hmm. Grant or, you know, people doing sort of contemporary work. And as far as I know, <laughs> all the people that are doing contemporary work are uh, have read at least, you know, some famous thinker of which were they're drawing off of, you know, even, um, you know, the, like the Coast Guard, you know, and, and in general, would obviously be reading from someone like Kant, McDowell, and Brandom, who although have very systematic philosophies, are also pulling heavily from Aristotle, Hegel, um, Kant, right, and obviously Sellers. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, you even you take also another person like Sellers, and who had also a very, um, what I, I presumably a very high interest within Kantian scholarship at the time that he was in there, and it just sort of to put this, I guess, into the perspective of the second topic, um, the analytic and continental divide, a lot of the earlier um, earlier philosophers, like uh, Kraser, or if I'm, I'm hopefully pronouncing it, is it Kasser, Kraser, or Kasser? Kasser, uh, Kasser. Yeah, Kasser, and Carnap, and Heidegger were extremely, especially Heidegger, extremely well read in the history of philosophy. And before they really started doing any sort of famous work, they were really acquainted with the history of philosophy in order to do what they're doing. I mean, I think this is the case even among, you know, the great modern philosophical thinkers, modern in the 
historical sense, right? Like, uh, you know, Kant was obviously prior to the critical turn a Wolfian, big into Leibniz, you know, had a pretty, pretty, I don't know, pretty serious understanding of at least history of ancient philosophy and medieval philosophy. Um, and then, you know, since he was embedded in the modern philosophy time, obviously understood what was happening there. Uh, but this is, uh, this is everyone, right? Like, I, I don't know all that many, even of the canonical figures that weren't drawing on the philosophy of others and developing their own systems. No, I mean, you go back enough in time, right? And the idea of not doing the history of philosophy, or at least to some extent, you know, I, I, I know that probably Kant wouldn't have been too well written within the scholastic tradition, at least I'm guessing. Um, and then there's obviously certain types of things that are occurring in the historical epoch that you're in that sort of avoids the prior uh, thinkers. But he still read, as far as I know, I mean, you know, Plato and Aristotle, um, and who hasn't, right? Um, there seems to be, I mean, you know, with any sort of philosophical exchange um, that I'm aware of, I mean, any major philosophical exchange, definitely some sort of references to some sort of historical period. Um, definitely some ideas that are pulled from any sort of historical period. And you might be able to sort of skirt the, skirt these areas somewhat. Um, but then I see a lot of reoccurring issues, right? Historical reoccurring issues from people who just haven't read the history of philosophy, uh, like you said earlier. Um, so I guess moving on to the second topic a little bit more. Uh, so what's what is the general idea that you have of the continental analytic divide? Uh, unless you want me to start out with that with that topic, I guess. I mean, what what yeah. do you think that this is a sort of pseudo divide, or you know, some? I mean, what are your thoughts there? I think as a substantive philosophical divide, it is probably a pseudo divide. But if it's something that talks about um, may, maybe analytic philosophy has a common method. Uh, I have no idea what would unite continental philosophy in a tradition other than being uh, the negation of analytic philosophy. Um, but analytic philosophy, so far as I understand it, could be seen as united in a method, if that's going to be something that is substantive and philosophical. But Really, I think when we use these terms, what we're talking about is just a kind of style, right? Like the way in which you read analytic philosophy, you know when it's analytic, right? You can tell it has, it feels like analytic philosophy. Uh, it's not so much something substantive, but it is, has to do with writing style, has to do with structure, uh, etc. And, you know, obviously it is commonly something which has come out of the United States and the United Kingdom, English-speaking world in general. So you give a sort of overview, I guess, for the audience about the analytic continental divide, if, if you guys aren't familiar with it, I'm sure, since for the majority of people who are listening into a philosophy podcast, they're probably somewhat familiar with the divide and what it would possibly mean. Uh, and this is one of the most prominent divides in the 20th century intellectual circles, according to many philosophers and both ends. That's said to originate, although um, this is, I, I guess, maybe some matter of controversy, uh, but it's said to sort of originate on Carnap's attack on Heidegger for semantical meaninglessness. That is, um, Heidegger had a sort of famous uh, phrase that nothingness itself, nothing's, um, if you read, you know, various portions of Martin Heidegger, he has this sort of idiosyncratic language that describes his uh, metaphysics slash ontology that um, is not going to be uh, sort of coherent unless you get really deep into what he exactly means and what the sort of analysis that he's doing. And according to Martin Heidegger, the idea that... What, sorry, the ideas that he's talking about, the ontological status of nothingness or the ontological status of being, 
and these are sort of arcane terms on maybe for some of the audience and what they possibly mean um, that I'm not going to go ahead and define all these things. It's mostly since we're talking about the, the subject of the analytic and continental divide and not Heidegger's philosophy itself. But this, this type of language, right, that he's employing, according to Heidegger himself, is supposed to be a type of language that precedes epistemology, that precedes logic, and that gives the conditions of possibility for logic to come about. Um, which is very strange, right? It would be especially strange for someone like Carnap because he says that when nothingness itself nothings, this is sort of semantically meaningless. Um, and that's because there's, there are certain types of rules that one has to play with logic. Um, and Heidegger's, Heidegger, Heidegger is basically completely fine with breaking these rules. So there's this sort of divide that came about, at least within the turn of the 20th century, in between these two thinkers that would have now sort of developed into a more rigid and uh, larger opposition between two sets of philosophers, particularly within the European world and then the Anglo-American world. However, um, I think one has to do some sort of history here and exactly what the divide was about, and it is obviously a sort of divide about what I just said in part, but what it sort of was originally about and whether um, even, even if there was some sort of divide, whether it really matters in any sort of um, functional or terminological or practical way um, in today's time. So if we look at the beginning of the continental and analytic divide, and if it is somewhere between Heidegger and Carnap and Kassir, and Kassir was someone who's tried to sort of mediate between the two uh, thinkers, um, the initial exchange between uh, all these thinkers occurred uh, in, in Davos, basically. It was known as the Davos Exchange. Um, and what we need to f what we need to know among these various thinkers there is that just before this exchange between he Heidegger and um, and Carnap or Kassir, that many of the various different types of schools of thoughts, like the logical empiricists, the Hercilian phenomenologists, the Neo-Kantians, and the Heideggerians, uh, were actually speaking to each other on very very friendly terms. They were using the same language. They were constantly interacting and having criticisms of a sort of fair and balanced, and it's already fair and just sort of way, which I think is the sort of exact opposite of what's occurring today. So the original pioneers of this sort of divide um, wouldn't have had any of the sort of dispositional attitudes that contemporary... Um, analytic slash continental thinkers would have had today, right? The sort of animosity and the sort of uh, charge of um, semantical meaninglessness in um, continental philosophy and the charge of over-specialization within the analytic tradition and the sort of devaluation of existential and lifelike questions in their philosophy. So... You know, during the 1920s, basically, you know, there was an equal exchange. And what did it, what did all of these people have in common, basically? What did they all originate from? The neo-Kantians, the phenomenologists, the logical empiricists, and the Heideggerians. Well, they all came from one sort of really big issue, and that was interpretation of Kant and exactly what is Kant trying to spell out with the critique of pure reason and how do we progress Kantian um, metaphysics, if we even want to progress Kantian metaphysics. And, you know, this has sort of been forgotten, you're right. I mean, we have all these different types of specializations now within both the traditions and kind of they've gone off track from this original sort of question. But we need to remind ourselves that this was the original question of why there sort of is a sort of split here. Uh, you can you could tie it to Russell as well, but I mean, what Russell was dealing with is going to relate into some way with the uh, German idealist tradition of and Kant. 
So Heidegger had a sort of existential um, interpretation of Kant, which stated something like that we can't, I mean, the, the major contribution of Kant was basically um, that that we can't do philosophy other than through the finite perspective, that we have no real hard metaphys that we can't make real hard metaphysical commitments. And I'm a little bit less sure about the sort of Carnapian uh, interpretation of Kant, but I believe Carnap wanted to say something like, we're not barred from making certain types of ontological commitments. Um, and that we can actually see the world and that science is going to somehow in a sort of way help us. And there have been a lot more nuanced interpretations of Kant since then. I think there's better interpretations of Kant other than Heidegger's and Carnap's for now. Um, and those are still continuing, I think, on both sides. So it's, it's sort of weird, right, to see a divide basically occur because of certain types of, certain types of things like this. So again, if we go back to the 1920s, um, they'll actually, you can find um, handwritten dialogues and uh, uh, a sort of exchange between Heidegger and Carnap, um, on, all on friendly terms, actually. Uh, this is a sort of analysis that I read when I was reading um, A Parting of Ways by, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the scholar if you've read Kant, A Parting of Ways by, uh, what's his name, Friedman. Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of, I wanted to approach, uh, I, I do think that there is a sort of divide in, in, in that historical sense is the sort of disagreement that they had. Of course, various different types of schools had various types of disagreements, and we still have disagreements now. I think I agree with you kind of on the issue that if you read certain types of analytic texts or continental, there seems to be a sense of where you figure them out. But, I mean, there also seems to be a sense that when I read someone like Derrida or when I read someone like Heidegger or when I read someone like McDowell, they all have a different way of going about doing philosophy, at least functionally, right? Or at least the types of things that they do and how they write seems to all be variously uh, and different and contingent. So, I mean, like the, the sort of general attack that, um, you know, one language is vacuous or something like that, um, seems sort of off-putting to me. It seems sort of um, seems sort of vacuous that either either side is doing something that's completely bankrupt. I much agree with that. This was a, an interesting historical story uh, that I was not as familiar with, but I it seems to me like that history has very little to do with how the distinction persists today yeah because it, I, yes. historically it sounds like it was grounded in a real substantive disagreement a substantive a real substantive yeah a real that. substantive philosophical disagreement rather than just one about you know how it is we should write or something like that well i mean at least in that end um maybe you can also talk about the historical significance of russell and and and, and Wittgenstein or whatever and then his sort of general frustration with I don't know, Frege or whatever, but I mean, even there, you know, you have some sort of correspondence between Herzl, Frege, and Russell. Um, and I'm sure they were, you know, I mean, they're probably cordial with each other. I mean, we have documented evidence su suggesting that Carnap and Heidegger were on cordial terms. As a matter of fact, the sort of accus uh, accusation that Carnap gave of Heidegger on the meaninglessness of language uh, when he wrote it, um, he knew that Heidegger would just reject it. He knew that Heidegger didn't care, and he was actually okay with that. Apparently, they had another conversation later on, and Heidegger admitted, like, look, I mean, maybe we could naturalize all philosophy, and that's sort of where they left it at one point. Um, but they had a parting of ways in the sense that, you know, World War II was eventually around the corner, um, and guess who stayed in Germany, and guess who, you know, didn't stay in Germany. So, you know, um, Carnap would have gone not in Germany, and would have gone in America, I think. And, you know, Heidegger, as we well known, um, was sort of Nazi sympathizer, unfortunately, became um, one of the leading um, professors within, um, I, f I forgot which university off the top of my head, maybe Freiburg. I'll have to relook that one up. Um, but, you know, one of the head uh, rectors, basically, over there. 
and also a sort of Nazi sympathizer who tried to get rid of various types of political ideologies like communism. That was obviously becoming more prominent within the USSR. Um, so, so yeah, I do think that there's sort of substantive beginnings there that have turned into non-substantive quarrels. Um, and luckily there's, luckily there's a lot of people I think today or not a lot of people, but at least some people who seem to be bridging the divide between analytic and continental philosophy. I remember one of the books that I read <clears throat> um, when I first started reading philosophy was um, a book by Lee Braver called A Thing of This World, A History of Continental Anti-Realism. It was a great book. I'm actually going to probably pull it up here in just a second uh, for the audience to see. And this was just like a giant history. He's more, he, he calls himself more of a continental thinker. They're just a giant history of Kant, Hegel, um, Foucault, Derrida, and Heidegger. I think his best, his best um, work is Heidegger, since he does more scholarship on that. But relating them to the type of uh, philosophical jargon that we see in analytic philosophy. And more people need to do this type of work. Um, more people need to sort of bridge the sort of terminological divide between these two schools of thought because I do see generally a lot of accepted language between both schools of thought even though um, they might reach similar types of conclusions. Yeah, after making comments here, the divide is certainly not one of content, rigor, or even style. Ever try reading Sellers? It's a distinction born of sociology and funding bodies. Um, I think the last sentiment is probably true, that it is mostly a result of a sociological division and one that has to do with the way that we're structuring university departments, at least. But I, I would also say, like, there does seem to be a genuine distinction in style. And even if Sellers is really hard, it's not because he writes in the way that a continental philosopher does. And Sellers is really hard. There, There's many, many different analytical philosophers who are extremely difficult to read or have inordinate amounts of uh, pretty much pointless formalization that's really unintelligible. But uh, again, that's something that's characteristic of, of the unintelligible analytic philosophy rather than the unintelligible continental philosophy. So someone says, you guys keep talking about the division about the two competing camps without providing examples of how they differ. Um, and that's, and that's, and, and that begins to be sort of the difficulty exactly <laughs> trying to find the formal tools in which they differ, right? Um, because one can say certain types of things of how they formally differ, but, but then the further I go with these types of descriptions, the, the more I realize how foolish they are. So I could say things like, okay, well, analytic philosophy is more focused with syllogistic arguments and logic and rigor and clarity and, and having, you know, easy to digestible, uh, easy digestible sentences. But I can continue this sort of list of, uh, you know, values and traits. Um, but then I begin, you know, thinking about various types of analytical thinkers that I read that aren't easy, digestible, clear, any of those types of things. Um, they're quite hard, and they, they tend to be, I think, um, harder than some of the continental thinkers that I've read, uh, particularly if they just, you, you know, use a, a dick ton of syllogisms, right? If they just keep on pouring... Um, with various types of um, logical arguments over and over and over. Uh, and there, I mean, there's some extraordinarily hard continental thinkers too, and some ones that are really clear. So, concepts like these, obviously, from a Kantian perspective. So, if I'm going to talk about continental philosophy, then that needs to be like a universal that's represented by some rule. Right, or there has to be some rule that unifies all the particular in this concept of continental philosophy. I have no idea what kind of principle I would articulate if I was talking about the concept of continental philosophy. Analytic philosophy is slightly more stable in the ways I think that Marty just mentioned, that they make use of some similar tools, at least, conceptual analysis, formal method, etc. I definitely, you know, some I, I had a conversation with one day, uh, one day with... Um a guy, I think his name was actually JHC from 
the people that know who JHC is and are listening to me and then listening to him and he basically said that analytic language the type of um, some, uh, yeah the type of language that's deployed with an analytic philosophy is more universal and more universally rec uh, yeah just more universally recognized um, than continental language and it's just more easily digestible but I just I, I don't I don't think that that's true at all in any sort of way um, I don't think that many people at all use analytic language outside of analytic philosophy <laughs> um, but I also don't think that many people use you know continentalish language outside of continental philosophy you know um, you know the transcendental unity of a perception the Hesselian epoche, uh, things like that, right? These don't seem like universal notions. These seem like very specific philosophical um, kind of blade of grass, <laughs> uh, nuanced words, right? Now, there might be slightly less nuanced words and ones that are, I mean, things that are sort of more universally recognized, but I think that this is just because we begin abstracting from continental philosophy and talk about the history of philosophy. So if I say things like essence or form or substance, right, these things um, I think are a little bit more often used anywhere um, between, I mean, between both of these worlds, if there is a, if there is a sort of divide. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's all I would have to say right there in terms of if there are any sort of real substantive distinctions between these two philosophers i'm not sorry be, be, between these two divisions i'm not really quite sure what they would amount to other than a historical overview and and then certain forms of prejudices between the um between various types of professors and um, you know academic settings and then just the various commitment that one doesn't want to talk to another one and they know where these lines are in some sort of fuzzy way and the thinkers themselves, if we want to just arbitrarily or ad hoc just say that this thinker is associated with that tradition just because everyone else agrees with it. Um, and that seems to be the basis of the divide, right? So we'll say people like Heidegger, uh, Hessel, Derrida, Foucault, all these thinkers, um, Michel Henry, um, Meryl Ponte, these are continental thinkers, uh, Davidson, um, Moore, Russell, um, Klein, these are more analytic thinkers. Often that's the way in which we uh, we often define philosophical traditions in general, is just to give a list of names. Uh, very often, though, I think when we do give a list of names, and then we try to ask, okay, what principle unifies the philosophies of all these people? Uh, it's sometimes really hard to pull out, so we might be working in pseudo-concepts to begin with. Definitely. It's like when we talk about postmodernism or something like that, we give a list of names, Derrida, Foucault, Deleuze, et cetera. And then we say, this is postmodernism. You know, it's just represented by these canonical figures. But then you have to ask, well, what's in common here? And sometimes it turns out that there's really not much in common, I think. So let's move on to the uh, third topic, and this is probably the one that's going to last, I guess, the longest between us, and something that you are obviously a little bit more knowledgeable in since you're doing research. Um, so what are the sort of things, I know you wanted to talk about morality, and I know you wanted to talk about Freud, but why don't you give us a sort of exposition into both of these thinkers and what you're going to be talking about, um, and what, do you, what kind of ideas do you have that you think are novel if uh, unless there's you know unless you just think you're doing historical work yeah uh so okay i should start by saying this whole project is motivated by or starts with uh analytic philosopher if i can use that term j david bellaman wrote a paper um called a rational superego and in this paper he attempts to recapture and revise some Freudian insights to provide what he considers a much needed story of moral development for Kantian practical philosophy. Um, and I think Velleman's account, Velleman's paper is really interesting and important, but it obviously like any other paper has some weaknesses and some gaps. And I want to explore the space of his contributions, try to remedy the, the weaknesses. Um, so I guess we start with the first question, 
uh, start with the concept of, of moral development, right? What, what is moral development? What are we talking about? And why do we need a story of it? And why do Kantians need a story of it? Uh, and what's Freud's story of it? So to begin an inquiry into moral development, we have to ask, you know, what is it that we're developing into? What is the feature that's developing? When we begin a general inquiry into, say, language acquisition, we know at least at least roughly what we're looking for, and that's the transition from infancy to being a language user. Similarly, when we're trying to outline the transition from, uh, or similarly in this case, I think we're trying to outline the transition from infancy to moral personhood. Right? That's that's what moral development's really getting at. Looking the story of moral development will explain how we go from infancy to moral personhood, and sufficiently arguing for you know a particular conception of moral personhood is is not the work of a day. It's a tough task. Uh, but Velleman, in particular, is attempting to provide a story of moral development for Kantian practical philosophy. And so we have the luxury of starting with the Kantian conception of moral personhood. And I'll give an account of that now. Okay. So according to Kant, uh, he's uh, let me pull up passages if I can. Uh, and you and you his name was Bellman, you said? Velleman. He's oh, a Bellman. philosopher at NYU, V E L L E M A N. Um, and what is the relevant book? It's a it's a paper, it's called A Rational Superego. A rational superego. Okay. Alright. So Kant's conception of moral personhood. Start there. Start with what we're what we're developing into. According to Kant, a person is a subject whose actions can be imputed to him, he says. Moral personality is therefore nothing other than the freedom of a rational being under moral laws. Okay. So this is a conception of moral personhood which relies on responsibility. And it is constituted by the capacity to grasp the moral law and to grasp the binding force or the normativity of the moral law. Um... And I mean, this is a this is a big part in the literature. Like, what is it? How, how is it that a law can be normative? How is it constitutive? Laws can be normative. Very briefly, I'm just going to say, it's not just that you have to be capable of understanding the content of a law for it to be normative, but that you also have to be able you have to be capable of understanding the law's normativity itself. You have to have a grasp. You have to have the capacity to grasp that the law is binding on your faculties. Okay, and I'll I'll say more here. So let's grant that a rational agent considers himself the uh, responsible for his actions or the author of his actions because his actions are a result of or a product of his judgment about what he has reason to do, right? He's not a mere slave to desires or impulses in the Kantian sense, but you can consider those and you can challenge them and you can delay their satisfaction, you can choose between them, etc., on the basis of reasons that are independent of them, reasons that are independent of desires. You judge defeasibly what is and is not a reason worthy of action, and you act under what Kant calls the idea of freedom. And this is really interesting, actually. Kant, I think importantly, Kant tells us we are really free in a practical sense, acting under the mere idea of freedom. That is, in the regulative sense, that we must act as if we were free, right? Because in this case, the same laws, practically, would hold to us as would hold to people who are actually free. And so he says, we can escape here from the burden that weighs upon theory. That is, we don't have to make the case even for theoretical freedom, so long as we act, and we must act, under the idea of freedom. Um... So from the beginning, it seems clear that an infant lacks this kind of responsibility. Uh, it's clear that their rationality is so limited as to not be capable of grasping laws or having laws be binding on their faculties. We don't arrest a baby or something like that. But somewhere along the way, at least some human beings develop into the kind of things which regard themselves as choosing courses of actions on the basis of reasons, reasons of different quality, and and can therefore be held to justificatory standards for those reasons. We have somehow developed into the kinds of things 
which can have our actions imputed to us and which stand under moral laws. And how, how did this happen is the, the, the question. And who, who is to say and how are they to say it? Um, I think when I first engaged with this literature, my first thought was, why is it, as a philosopher, should I have a story of moral development? Why, why do I concern myself with that? Why haven't we satisfied our motivations by articulating the moral theory itself, and why isn't it now for us to leave to the folks in the exact sciences to figure out? And further, I'm going to drink some water for a second. Further, and more particularly, in the case that I'm working in, in the case the development's working in, why should Kantian philosophers concern ourselves with moral development? Um, and in the end, I think there's sufficient answers to these questions. Um, and I think that it's, or I'm, I'm planning on framing it in light of Korsgaard's discussion in a section of one of her books. The chapter of, is titled The Normativity of Instrumental Reason. Which I actually think, we had a conversation in text the other day, Marty, and it would be really helpful for you to read that section, The Normativity of Instrumental Reason. Okay. Um, so Korsgaard paints a picture which I think is, is very simple, but I also think it's very excellent and largely correct. Moral principles, she tells us, have to be capable of serving as both a standard and a motivation of action. Mm -hmm. We have to... They have to be able to guide actions, and they must possibly serve as an efficacious cause of an action. So you're you're also then admitting that they're going to that there has to be some sort of met, that motivating force. It's not going to be just be something that coerces us, as you know, it kind of grips us from the outside without us wanting it to grip us. Right? There is mm -hmm. there's a sort of motivational force, which is strange because you also seem to. I don't mean to cut you off because you seem to indicate that we're acting upon reasons and not feelings. That's right. But there is a, but there is a moral feeling associated with with Kant, right? I think you're right about this. For in the first part, I would say um, we don't need to be motivated per se by moral feelings. And I would also say, and I think that Korsgaard really answers precisely the objection that you're giving, at least or not objection, but sort of uh, the beginnings of an objection. Um, it seems to be the case that, you know, actually, I'll go ahead and I'll fill out the picture, and you'll already see how this is answered. All right, okay. So, okay. so we can understand, I think, uh, the success of the Kantian project in articulating a moral principle and the failures of other projects in articulating moral principles. Uh, in, in light of this. And Korsgaard focuses particularly on the empiricists and the rationalists, as this is her schema, right? The two failed projects, or how the empiricists treat this and how the rationalists treat this. And according to Korsgaard, the empiricists attempt to establish moral requirements on the basis of some uncontroversial hypothetical imperatives, right? By demonstrating, and one thing you said earlier was that, you know, the reasons are independent of our wants. I think that's the case. I think sometimes we can say we don't want this, but, but we don't desire this, but it is binding on our faculties nonetheless, and yet can still motivate action. Because I'm, what I have to say here is that there are reasons independent of desires that can serve as causes of action. But okay. the empiricist wants to, again, establish moral requirements on the basis of some hypothetical imperative. And, you know, like... It's, by, for instance, demonstrating that moral conduct is in our interests in the way that you just said, right? Saying that a person's overall good is what he really wants or something like that. And, you know, experience and observation are always the method of the empiricist. And so you have to, what they try to do is appeal to what we'll, we'll all locate in our faculty of desire, right? And it's easy to see how people are motivated to act by their desires. Um, in any case, this lends to a picture of practical rationality where, as Korsgaard puts it, to be practically rational is to be caused in a certain way. And so the necessity to act in a certain way must always be a causal necessity. So while the empiricist can explain how a, a moral principle like this can motivate action, they can, in the end, 
explain how their principles are standards of actions, as observation makes us privy only to patterns of action and not standards for them. By contrast, the rationalists, according to Korsgaard, try to try to establish moral requirements on the basis of some a priori and, like you were saying, independent ontological foundation. By positing the existence of some, uh, she says, by positing the existence of certain normative facts or entities to which moral requirements somehow right. refer. Right. So, yeah, that's that, that does seem to be describing the sort of divide between the rationalist and empiricist. And mm -hmm. as I recall, Kant has a sort of healthy solution that includes yes. both. Right. But so that's, the rational... mm -hmm. but that, that's so the exactly ra why I brought up moral feelings, because it's not, mm -hmm. you know, you know it's not I don't I don't think the answer is in feeling, though. I don't think the answer is there. I think he wants to say there can be things that that motivate that are efficacious causes of action that are outside of mere feeling. Although in the end, we do care about obviously developing healthy moral feelings. The the rationalists locate normative principles by appealing to certain logical truths. And so by contrasting the empiricists, they ground the normativity in logical necessity rather than causal necessity. And this is a picture of practical rationality, wherein Course Guard says to be rational is to deliberately conform one's will to certain rational truths, or truths about reason, importantly, which exist independently of the will, right? Categorical, or, or the rationalists look for categorical imperatives external to the will. Mm -hmm. And so they can't explain, says Korsgaard, how the imperatives can serve as causes of action, how they can motivate action. Uh, and so the rationalists can explain how moral principles guide actions, how they serve as standards, but they can't explain how they motivate. Right. And then the Kantian, Korsgaard explains, offers a third way. Right. On the Kantian conception of practical rationality, to be rational just is to be autonomous. That is, to be governed by reason and to govern yourself are one and the same thing. Yeah, she says this very same thing in the book Self-Constitution. Right. The principles of practical reason are constitutive of autonomous action. They don't represent external restrictions on our actions okay. like they did for the rationalists, whose power to motivate us is therefore inexplicable but instead describe the procedures involved in autonomous willing. They function as normative or guiding principles because in following these procedures, we're guiding ourselves. But because they're internal to the will, it's by turning away from the world, the empirical world, and turning away from you know, the mysteries of the heavens or whatever the rationalists are dealing with, and toward the finite rational subject as itself, which, as toward the finite rational subject itself is that which discloses the domain of normativity, that the Kantian can explain how moral principles both serve as standards and motives. It's by putting the standard internal to the will rather than external to it. I think that's the, the essential move. Right. So it's not going to be a coercive force in the sense that something outside always has to act dependently upon certain types of dispositional traits that I have, certain types of desires um, or sentiments. It's rather that the type of agent that I am is going to be constitutive with a set of moral principles that I'm going to be acting in accordance with, and those aren't separate from my will. And then no longer, yeah, it's no longer inexplicable how how it has motivating force. Right. Um, but to this point, right, I and Korsgaard have only said something of the metaphysics of morals. Right, of moral theory proper and not of moral development and moral phenomenology. Mm -hmm. So just, well, uh, I, just, just, to, just to kind of help the audience out here and, and, and pause it just for a second, if you can explain, I guess, exactly a little bit more what the definition of constitutivism is and, why, and, and how this relates to Korsgaard's project. Sure. So, uh, so there's a distinction in epistemology and logic between constitutive and regulative rules, right? A constitutive rule, I'll, I use an example often to explain this, and it's when you're playing a game of chess. When you play a game of chess, there are certain rules that are constitutive of the game of chess. They define what it is chess is as a game. Uh, by contrast, there are also some regulative rules of chess, right? And to follow these rules, you may be playing chess well if you follow these regulative rules. 
Um, if you follow the constitutive rules, you're just playing chess. Okay. I think the best way to explain what Corps Guard does is to say that when you move the rook diagonally, it's not just that you're playing chess poorly. It's that you're no longer even playing chess. She says this is basically what happens when we are uh, acting immorally or acting irrationally. We're not just violating some regulative rule of reason, but we're violating the very principles that are constitutive of reason. Uh, and so when we do that, we're sacrificing our identity or violating or disrespecting our identity as rational subjects. Right. And we could we could toss in other examples, right? So if, uh, you know, I've got, she gives one other one, a sort of constitutive outlook, um, and that's like building a house. So a house has certain types of functions or it has a certain type of form. We can kind of make um, constitutivism isomorphic with the formal structure of it or what it's intended to do. Um, it's intended to keep out rain and, you know, somewhere where we dwell in and somewhere where we get housing. So even though there might be various trees obstructing me from a beautiful view, we wouldn't say that those trees have made a bad house, right? It has nothing to do with value preferences. It's just that we've gotten the, the form of it right. We've gotten the sort of functional purpose of a house correct. And that's just what it constitutively means to talk about a house. It's just that it has certain types of um, formal constraints. Uh, but maybe the chess example is a little bit more straightforward because, you know, this, there is a sort of straightforward way of where you violate a chess rule when you move a rook diagonally. Yeah, that's an example I got from a paper from Clinton Tolley, actually. Um, in any case, and he was he was doing it insofar as it applies to logic rather than uh, rather than normativity or metaethics. But in any case, I think that uh, to this point, after talking about Korsgaard framing that whole dispute up, we've only said something about the metaphysics of morals, right. about moral theory, not about moral development. And question I find myself starting with, and I'm sure other people find themselves starting with, is should the philosopher talk about, should they extend their reach to the latter spaces, to moral development, to moral phenomenology? I think that from this course card frame, we can figure out that we have to. Because otherwise, we're left with a skeptical worry. Uh, that is, I don't actually... In my view, this skeptical worry is analogous to the skeptical worry that motivates the second step of the B deduction of the categories, but I'm not going to explain that statement. So for those of you who are following, you're following. I'll give it alternative explanations uh, anyways. So we haven't yet determined how moral principles can actually serve as efficacious causes of action, I think, after this course guard. Uh, frame. Instead, we've only explained how they can possibly serve as an efficacious cause of action, right? We're tasked to demonstrate that we actually are the kind of autonomous willers to whom such standards would apply. If we're not those things, actually, right? It could be, if there were such a being who was autonomous in the way that is described, then those standards would apply to them. Right, but we have to demonstrate further that we are actually the kind of autonomous reasoners to whom those standards apply. We have to guarantee that the moral phenomena which we think we encounter in the world are actually correspondent with some moral principles or with our moral principles that we have articulated. Uh, and I think this worry can also be understood in terms of Kant's repeated insistence that a metaphysics of morals isn't enough to satisfy reason's interests. Rather, we have to go further uh, by issuing or constructing a moral anthropology. And then he writes an anthropology from a pragmatic point of view. Um, so this is why we need a story of moral development. I think at least we've gone there. Okay. And um, let me pull up one other document. And from here, Villeman gives us one account. 
and it is an account which draws on Freud's theory of the superego, right? Um, essentially, Freud's theory of the superego claims that we as young children, or even before being called a child, internalize the actual authority of our father, the, the, the paternal parental authority, into the superego, as it's called, conscience, right? When we do something wrong, we hear the voice of our father in the back of our head saying, bad, don't do that, you know, this kind of thing. Um, but there's a tension here. Uh, and the tension is that the tension is that Freud has a theory of moral development which is explicitly anti-rational, right? Uh, excuse me, sorry, I'm getting a call. I need to end that. Um, Freud has a theory that's explicitly anti-rational, mm -hmm. right? It says that there aren't, for instance, reasons independent of desires that motivate us for action. Um, right. He, if I recall. I don't know if this is actually true in, in, in Freudian scholarship that he's just a psychological egoist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know how much I would, uh, you know, bet my knowledge of Freud to make a claim like that. I'm <laughs> yeah. still I'm not super strong on Freud, but um, in any case, uh, why can't I find these notes, man? In any case, Bellman wants to say that we can Freud's theories of moral development sorry I'm now reading the comments um, in any case what Bellman wants to say is we can revise this theory there is a, the revise this theory about the relation between the superego and the ego the ego is like the subject the superego is conscience and the superego instructs the ego in what to do really or uh, you know it's that voice in the back of our head that tells us we should be doing something or shouldn't be doing something Right, just to give a, a, a slight overview, the, the ego is sort of in conjunction with the reality principle in the sense that there's, there's the general desires that we have that we need to satiate, but we can't just satiate them arbitrarily, right? We need to satiate them in virtue of some actual, something empirically grounded, right? So uh, this, the, the, the ego basically tries to find practical means of doing that in, in, in the world and then the superego is going to develop certain types of moral codes because it obviously has to also practically engage in the world um, mm -hmm. but but altogether it seems Freud's theory is really egological or at least doesn't seem to have any relationship with moral values such as the one that you seem to be saying that Kant does exactly the case um, exactly the case and it also seems uh, well I don't actually go there but it also seems like this is a theory in which we can say there is something, and I think this is what Bellman is seizing on, right? It also seems like there is a sense in which we can say within this one sort of theory of the subject or structure of the subject that we have both a legislator and an obedient of the law, right? We have these two aspects in it. It makes it easy to see how the principles of action could be principles that are internal or constitutive of one's subjectivity, uh, because they're, it, it makes both self-legislation possible and also makes uh, the idea that these principles are internal to the will, internal to the subject, rather than external to them. So I think he's seizing on these similarities and then saying, now we need to figure out, because A, Freud's theory of moral development is really compelling, we think, and B, moral theory is really compelling. How is it we can resolve the tensions of Freud's moral theory, story of moral development such that it's compatible with and explanatory for uh, the Kantian practical philosophy? And Bellman says we, we do this um, by... See, but we, he says we do this by realizing that on a Kantian account, what it is we'd be internalizing is not the actual authority of the father, but the ideal authority or the loving authority of the parent. 
And he says that when we internalize the ideal or loving authority of the parent, and this is our first encounter of the moral law in the world, he thinks, is when they treat us as ends in ourselves. That's what the loving authority of the parent represents. It represents them sacri often sacrificing their own interests in the interest of the child and in loving and respecting the humanity in the child, valuing the humanity of the child. This is our first exposure to the categorical imperative. And it's supposed to be explanatory for um, how it is we've found these moral phenomena in the world that are correspondent with the moral principles, moral concepts that we've theorized about. Okay. I definitely follow so far. <laughs> Excellent. So my question is, and one of the questions that Vellman confronts himself with is how it's possible for the, how it's, how the capacity of the rational ego to choose its authorities is possible. Right? The way we, we take in not only our parents, but other people's parents, priests, teachers, et cetera, as authorities, right? Of course, this is right. It's not just our parents, but others as well. There has to be an independent sort of judging that determines how it is we take in and internalize authorities into a, a rational superego. Where does this independent sort of judging come from? Uh, well, Vellman says that there's a problem in saying that you get it from the parent, because then I think we fall into something pretty immediate. And then there's a, another problem, we can't get it from other parents either, because our first exposure to it has been from our own parents. So what, what's the, it has to be independent of both of these sources of authority, the sources of authority that we're choosing between judging, this faculty of judging. Villeman says, well, here's what we should do. Uh, we should just say it comes as part of our package as people, right? He posits this, this faculty of judging that allows us to pick and internalize what gets taken into the superego to guide our actions. We're just, we were born with it. Now, I think, my criticism of this, uh, I think that just as Korsgaard has made criticism of the rationalist for putting, just as Korsgaard has made criticism of the rationalist for just positing this normative principle, right, rather than uh, having it explained in experience, having it, having the Ha rather than having an explanation of its efficacious causality. We've done, A, we've assumed what was sought, right? It was the case that this is what we were looking for to begin with, I think. If we have an independent sort of judging between ideal authorities, it means we already had a conception of this ideal to begin with. So it seems like the story of mo moral development just fades away a little bit insofar as we didn't actually have to look to the world to figure out what this was. It turns out we already had this idea of it. Uh, and then B, I think that it, it falls prey to a parallel skeptical worry as the rationalists. Um, you can't just posit the normative entity. It's something that you have to uh, understand on the occasion of sense. You need to explain how actual people in the world come across or discover these reasons independent of their desire for actions. Right? If we have an, intu an intuition of the moral, or if we know it, or if we deduce it, these are very different. If we have an intuition that has to be explained, if we learn it, that has significance, it needs to be explained. If everyone who feels the force of it has to deduce it for themselves, this needs to be explained. The faculty of judging needs a source also. And I think that this source... I want to appeal to, and, and this is the part that's most flaky, and that I don't, I haven't worked on as much. But I think that the, the the source should be nature, right? Which is the only constant outside of these two agential kinds of authority. Emile, Rousseau's Emile, is brought up with nature as his first teacher until his adolescence. Um, right when he climbs up the tree and falls down. He hurts himself and has to get back up and do it another way. 
when he sticks his hand on a hot stove, he finds out it hurts and doesn't do that again. Uh, it is the idea in particular of the lawfulness of nature, right? The idea of rational consistency of the fact that the, the categorical imperative is often regarded as the idea or the form of a law as such. And I think our first brush with lawfulness itself is not actually with one of these uh, teachers, with these human authorities, parents, priests, etc., but is instead uh, with nature itself and its own consistency, its own laws, its own guiding principles. So, I mean, the obvious question there would be where do these moral laws consist of in nature? I mean, where, where are they demonstrated? So not moral laws. I'm not, I'm not talking about moral laws in nature. Uh, I'm talking about just descriptive laws that uh, that determine nature. So when we run into, you know, it's the case that I'll fall down because uh, I'll fall from the tree and it'll hurt real bad because gravity pulls me down, you know. Like it's, it's just laws that are, con it's the idea of consistency and rational consistency. Um, and also, again, if you, if you want to conceive of, and a lot of people do, at least in analytic literature, conceive of the categorical imperative such that it's so empty as to only be really the principle of non-contradiction, we say, there are no contradictions in nature, only apparent ones. And every time I come across one, I learn in the end that there's some other explanation for it. So if these are just descriptive laws, then why are we relating them to morality in any sort of way and to a theory of moral development? Mm -hmm. So this is this is the first under I, I don't think you're um I don't think you're learning anything by way of moral content from nature. Rather uh, the capacity to make these kind of judgments. Um one, one, uh, I should, I should say this. Okay. So what we're asking is not per se where moral content comes from. Okay. But about a particular condition of, um, of personhood or of, so, so I, I mentioned the anthropology earlier. I mentioned Kant's anthropology. Kant actually does have, despite what Velleman says about, how Kant and Kantians need a theory of moral development, Kant actually kind of has this already in the anthropology. Uh, and Kant's account of this is called character, right? Uh, how we cultivate character. Um, and cultivation of character is, so what character really is, is, is not, it doesn't have much to do with the moral content itself. Right, but instead that I operate in accordance with a kind of stable set of maxims. They don't have to be moral maxims. They don't have to be right, but that I um, that I at least have like if I'm even even if I'm wrong, like I can have bad character. He calls it firmness of principles is the real definition of character. Firmness of principles. So I'll have some stable set of principles, even if they're evil principles, and I'll act in accordance with those. Right, that's someone who has character, even if it's not good character, even if they're not a moral uh, person in the virtuous sense. And he says rather, uh, or at least also, this isn't a condition for the possibility of there being bad action, but the, it is a, a condition for the possibility of there being good action, as good action has to be undertaken out of reverence for the law. And so we have to have this firmness of principles in order to act in accordance with the categorical imperative and reverence for the categorical imperative. Um, and I think it's precisely this kind of firmness that we find in the laws of nature, right? Like the first thing we figure out about these, these laws is that they're, they're pretty damn firm, right? They're not changing. They're consistently applicable and binding to us. And that's what, what I think we're learning from nature. It is how this bindingness works, how there are principles that are binding on things and how there are principles that are binding on our faculties. Uh, and then, you know, after that, I think Velleman is right. After that, I think it's the case that we get the rest of that moral content, we get the, the form of it 
which I think, for instance, okay, so if I were to put it in terms of, of non-contradiction or put it in forms of even the formulas of the categorical imperative, I've thought of it in this way. So there's, you know, the three main formulations of the categorical imperative. There's the formula of universalization, which states that you act only in accordance with that maxim, which you can at the same time will as a universal law. And then there's the second formulation, the law of humanity, act only when you're respecting persons in the ends in themselves, when you're respecting their humanity as such. Um, and then there's the third, the formula of autonomy, which is um, like the first, except instead of focusing on us as um, people who are just acting according to laws. It uh, talks about us in our capacity as being law givers, right? Only will, like, like only give yourself laws that are in accordance with. So I think the first one of these is the kind of formal uh, expression of the categorical imperative. The second one, the formula of humanity, is the material expression of the categorical imperative. And then the third formula of autonomy is the unity of these, where we have the material and we have the form. Um, and I think that what we're getting from nature is an understanding of that first part, which is just the form. And then the material formula of humanity we get from other people, right? So we get from the loving authority of the parent, just in the case as Velleman puts it. And then the third of these, when our autonomy is fully realized, happens usually, right, like in our teenage years, you know, when, when the laws that we're acting in accordance with, we no longer really hear the voice of our father or mother or whoever authority in our head that's telling us what to do. Okay. Instead, it's, it's us and a vision of a better us, right? We ourselves are giving ourselves principles. And incidentally, this is precisely when, for example, during these rebellious teenage years, when I'm doing away with the authority of the parent, when I'm starting to act in accordance with my own rules rather than their rules, when I question their rules, this is when we end up being granted the responsibility of moral and legal persons. Right? It's when we're about this age that they're like, yep, go into the world. If you hit someone, now it's your fault. Now, now, now if you've assaulted someone, you get to go to jail. Uh, we get to fine you, all these other things. So, but are these, if I'm, because uh, I'm not necessarily sure if I understand you entirely right now. So, obviously, these, these formulations, the three maxims that you've set forth, are necessities, are formal necessities that one has to follow as, as a rational agent, correct? Yeah, the forms of the categorical imperative, which obviously is always binding on our faculties. And... So are you saying that our mind in a sense recognizes these formal necessities through experience as a form of abstraction? Yes. Okay. So there's something there's some 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 kind of capacity like Kant postulated within the critique of pure reason that finds an a priori necessity. Um, so I'm wondering if what what type of knowledge is this? Do you think it's a priori synthetic, or are you not sure? Categorical imperative. No, all three of these maxims when they're learned. Yeah, yeah, they're all uh, synthetic a priori principles. Okay. Or, uh, I mean, he, he claims they're really just one, right? But. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I think I understand where this is going. Right, so this is also going to be in relation to the discursivity thesis that no knowledge can begin without experience, although in, in undoubtedly can occur independent of it. So I'm going to so what I'm seeing here is that you're going to have various types of experiences all of which we can abstract from therefore we don't need any particular one that are going to grant the possibility of these three maxims right of where we recognize the sort of necessity of these three maxims as an abstraction from all these various contingent relationships or contingent experiences but they don't just come out of nowhere right I mean any sort of transcendental argument is going to presuppose experience which has certain types of a priori conditions and those a priori conditions can only be gotten from experience which you know some sort of sensible intuition which can 
grant the possibility of even making a transcendental argument in the first place. Is that is that what's going on here, or my error? error no, I think I think you're on it. Okay. Yeah. And the problem here, the theoretical problem with what Velleman's done, I think, is the same theoretical problem that Kant and others recognize with the rationalists, right? Which is that he's he's acted like this is already fully realized, right? That it's not just potentiality, but uh, well, it would have to be. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. Uh, or it would, it would at least have to be by the time that we're morally developed or at least developed to the possibility that we can make moral judgments and act autonomously as agents. Um, I would gather, though, that this is an empirical question of when we're going to decide when. Because, I mean, this is a separate question. I mean, I don't think you have to demonstrate exactly when this happens because these are extraordinarily fuzzy concepts and it could just be up to the psychologists to decide exactly when we're when we reach a state of autonomy and, 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 and full moral development but I mean do, do you have a story there or is it just is it just given that you know because we're able to do this at a certain point and we weren't at, at, at a first point that there has to be some sort of development that's given their simplicity even though we don't know exactly how it occurs or when it occurs can you state the motivation for this question one more time i'm just wondering if you have some sort of demarcation some sort of um yeah demarcation point of when moral development occurs mm -hmm. you're just saying that no, it occurs yeah, not at all yeah yeah. yeah 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 okay that question i'm guessing you're just going to say is an empirical question that can be yeah yeah okay. and i mean i'm talking about like the type of stuff that happens in our lives that Correct. gets us yes. there but not when those things are you know yeah so those are going to be contingent and it might just be the case that moral development occurs faster or not as fast for certain type of people. Um, does this, and this is also going to be binding on sociopaths and psychopaths, right? They're, or, or do you think that that's not going to be binding towards these types of I people? Think, I think it is, right? And I think one, another problem that can be seen in Velleman's account is that if we just depend on the loving authority of the parent for internalizing a superego— there's a lot of people who probably had parents who didn't love them. And the fact that we're going to not even be able to call those moral persons is probably going to be a big problem for a lot of people. Maybe right. not for some. Maybe for some it's a feature rather than a bug. But I think for Kantians it's going to be a bug, right? Uh, and I think that, again, appealing to something which is constant, the form of nature, is something that can, I think, address this issue at least. I definitely agree with you there that... Um... If we're going to run from some sort of contingent um, contingent state of affairs, such as, you know, a loving parent or a loving mother or a loving father or some sort of priest that develops, you know, uh, develops our morality, then we're going to we're definitely going to find some sort of epistemic gap um, there when that doesn't occur. Uh, there's... Exactly. With just that, it's a story, I think, that underdetermines the amount of moral persons that actually exist i see yeah definitely um yeah i mean i think i agree with you that seems to be fairly consistent with uh with any sort of kantian philosophy that i've heard it can't just be that you offer some sort of purely um rational subject that seems to be equipped with rational capacities that are independent or sorry, completely, um, not independent, but ex exclude experience altogether, um, although it can be uh, decided independently. And, and then we have to sort of make the careful distinction, and some people confuse this. I don't think real philosophers confuse this distinction between independent and without. Um, you're, you're familiar with the distinction, right, Grant? Yes. Um, would you mind actually sort of uh, briefly going over that topic for the audience with us? Or? Yeah, I mean, insofar as I understand the distinction, it's also, and and tell me if you think this is right, also the same as the distinction between uh, from sense or from experience and on the occasion of sense or on the occasion of experience. Um, and so, or, or at least it's akin in a certain way. Insofar as one would say, particularly the Kantian and also some 
Cambridge Neoplatonists and Neo Cartesians before Kant. Um, I think it's the case that, for instance, someone wants to say that or the rationalists would try to posit something. It's also, I think, akin to the distinction between pure and a priori in Kant. Um, but in any case, I think that um, what one wants to say is that it's not the case that we uh, have to, if we're saying, if, if we're saying we're deriving something without experience, we're okay. saying that um, it is in the rationalist sense, right. uh, a principle that is totally divorced from, uh, like, oh, ooh, perfect analogy, sweet. Okay, so also, this is great, also, Chomsky gives a fucking perfect example for this in his linguistic theory, where he says, uh, you know, it can't be the case that the language faculty is just something that we have when we're born, boom, fully developed. Here we are talking right when we come out as a baby or something like that. Mm -hmm. But rather, it still has to be something he thinks which is, uh, which has a faculty a priori. And instead of saying it's fully realized and fully developed when it starts, we say like a limb that it grows, okay, on the occasion of sense, on the occasion of experience, rather than without completely. Or, or, or rather than derive from experience. So if it's derived from experience, it right. doesn't require those a priori faculties that we're talking about. It doesn't require the potentiality within us, but merely requires what's given an experience. Right. The way that I sort of explain this generally to people is one can imagine uh, all sorts of particular contingent state of affairs. Um, I think a pretty good one to kind of think about is when um, you know some sort of child or uh, young adult learns mathematics, right? And um, let's say that they learn mathematics in German. Um, was it the case that uh, the necessity of those mathematical laws that, you know, obviously you know hold true tomorrow needed to be demonstrated um, based on contingent state of affairs such as learning it in German? No, it could have been learned in French or, or in English, right? We would have equally re realized the necessity of those whether they would have learned in a different type of language, whether they would have learned in a different type of time. There is just something when someone learns certain easy um, mathematical formulas like addition um, that they realize the necessity of it, right? Um, and that necessity could be removed from any particular contingent state of affairs, any particular experience, but not all experiences whatsoever, right? And it would hold, and it would hold true in every single experience as well. Um, so I think this is this is sort of how I would break it break it down for people in general, because there is this sort of you know uh, naive view that independent of experience means that uh, you know we would have it, it's the same thing as innateism, right? And um, the, innateism seems much more philosophically controversial, although I don't I don't I don't think that we should eliminate it altogether, but there could be some innate um, faculties um, of human beings such that their nature contains these that were there before they actually do begin experiencing anything. But right. the a priori cognitive faculties are those that have to be, to use a sort of metaphor, stimulated into realization, right? Only right. stimulated or set into action or set into motion through an experience, but no particular experience. Right. And I think there's a sense in which we can still call these things innate. And, and for instance, this person is asking in chat, is Chomsky saying language is in some way innate to humans? He is saying that, but it's not innate in the naive rationalist Cartesian picture that people find to be controversial, like Marty just said. It's in the other sense. Right. Um, so let's read some of these comments right here. Um, if you see them. If there's anything in particular that you want to reply to, Grant? Um, where do they start? Well, one of the questions is, we are fooling ourselves if we think that reason is ever pure. It might be able to operate free of material or empirical influences, but it cannot escape the inherent wickedness of the human heart, which is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, meaning twisted for its own purposes, even unconscious desires. Is there anything that you wish to say? To, to that remark, Grant. I mean, uh, we are still doing 
Yeah, I think this is something that's a little more uh, out in space than anything we've talked about so far. But I don't think we're fooling ourselves if we ever think that reason is pure. In fact, it must be. Otherwise, I think every I, and this is this goes down to the heart of you know our different our meta philosophical differences. Me and this commenter. Uh, that everything you're doing right now, I think, is incoherent if reason is never pure. Right. In, in the in the sense that the Kantian talks about it. Yeah, this seems to be one of those misunderstandings. Exactly what uh, Kant means by pure. So, but but in a way, this this comment seems to realize it and then also jump out of it in the same time. So it might be able to operate free of material or empirical influences. That's precisely the point of what it means for something to be pure, at least in one way. Um, but it cannot escape the inherent wickedness of the human heart. Um, but that's just, yeah, to assume, yeah, it's just to assume human nature and to um, go back on uh, to, of what was originally stated, because these empirical and material influences are precisely what's going to make our heart wicked or not or not wicked. So. Right. I mean, and this is precisely what Kant thinks, right? I, I mean, he's saying, so, but it cannot escape the inherent wickedness of the human heart. Kant's saying, yeah, you're right. There is inherent wickedness in the human heart, born sinful or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, but that we can overcome those by operating out of reasons independent of them. So. Oh, does he think that we're born wicked? I, I mean, no, okay, not not in it, no, not not in not in a real, not born wicked in in the sense of like some Calvinist or something like that, but rather that there are certain dispositions that we have, and these dispositions have to do with uh, sort of perverted desires or inclinations, and when we operate in accordance with just mere desire, animal instinct, and inclination, we're acting heteronymously, and so not morally. Mm -hmm. That's move all on. I mean to say. So let's move on to some of these other ones. Um, um, do you think that one, when one wants to become a generalist, they must do so without ego? Um, I'm not sure what they mean by becoming a generalist. What I mean by ego, that there's an, that there's, that there intellect is not the end and be all i'm thinking of sam harris who believes that he has solved ethics without addressing meta ethics if i want to become a generalist i think i would try my best to value expertise above all else do you understand what's going on there brand i'm not sure if i quite follow what they mean yeah i mean i think that i think that here's what they're saying all right and i think this is actually a really important tension that's being identified and that one that i struggle with myself and right? i think what's happened when we've moved away from systematicity and when we've moved into the sort of analytic siloing of philosophy, the professionalization of philosophy, what's happened is we've thinned out a whole lot of our concepts. We're working in these little thin concepts. We're trying to make very weak claims. You know, I was told I was told just the other week that I need to realize that the strongest claims are really the weakest ones because they're the easiest to establish or whatever. But what ends up happening here is that we're making claims about almost nothing. We've thinned them out of existence. Now we're talking about something very little and insignificant. And yes, we've gotten our argument past the logic police, but none of it matters anymore, I think. Uh, the, one of the reasons for this that I think is a, a genuine and authentic reason for it is the desire to do philosophy from a, a perspective of epistemic humility. Right? I'm trying to be humble, so I'm trying to narrow my scope. I'm trying to thin my concepts. I'm trying to weaken my claims. Right. When I'm a generalist and when I'm working in these big, thick concepts, right, I'm doing bold shit. Right? Like I'm putting my I'm putting my uh, my stuff out into the line. You know, I'm I'm saying I'm making these big claims and, you know, it might take or, or it might seem as though I'm sacrificing humility in doing that. Right. So how is the generalist, the guy who's making the big systematic claims supposed to do so uh with humility without ego um now i See, think yeah you go ahead i do have i think personally that. i think personally and this isn't uh, a great thing uh is that a lot of the best philosophers are super narcissistic right and like the people and this is again not not great but it's simply the case that a lot of the most brilliant of them out there were really arrogant 
narcissistic, high ego philosophers, and they were great at it, probably in light of that. That being said, I don't think it's impossible to be a generalist without humility, or to be a generalist, and I don't think it's impossible to be a generalist and to be humble. Uh, rather, I don't know, a lot of great philosophers end up being arrogant dicks. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say in relation to that um, is that I always like to identify forms of pseudo-humility. Um, I got this kind of idea when I was reading... Um, Howlgate and um, The Logic. And in that book, he was basically uh, talking about this sort of Kantian humility um, when we postulate the noumenon or epistemic limits, we're being humble. Oh, you know, I don't know the entire world. How could I possibly know the entire world? I have certain types of finite cognitive capacities. Therefore, I can never see the world in and of itself. Um, how dare you address all these various types of things how could you possibly know um the vastness of, of of the human life there are more things within the world that are in your philosophy horatio um and to that i think that there's a sort of pseudo humility that's generated by the interlocutor speaking um in, in the sense that they they think that they want to a priori dismiss the idea of a systematic philosophy or a generalist, as this person put it, generalist form of philosophy, um, a priori. And I think that that's actually a form of arrogance that we can't a priori build a sort of systematic philosophy. So I like to sort of spin this angle back at them. And then I want them to demonstrate why is it so impossible why is it so unlikely? And even more, do we not have some sort of ethical responsibility or at least, you know, metaphysical or epistemic responsibility to at least attempt to do that and maybe possibly fail? Um, because a lot of the best type of philosophy, right, if you, if you go through an exchange with other philosophers and you go through the dialogue, like good debates of some sort, they're going to press you on a lot of metaphysical issues even if you're specialized only within metaethics or within filled religion. And once they press you on these issues, very specific nuanced, or maybe not even historical issues, but just issues like why is the PSR true? And we can ask this for a philosophy of religion. Or why is it not the Kantian version of the PSR true? And then they'd have absolutely no idea how to reply to that. But if you had a maybe a, a vast metaphysical system, um, some of these answers can't be that some of these questions can be answered. Um, and it's precisely in these moments of when we get into interdisciplinary studies, it's when we, uh, we begin to address generalist concerns and how, how to know how to apply philosophy to practically embodied situations, which is important. Um, because then, if we're not doing that, we're basically, in a sense, abstracted and La La Land and philosophy, and that's the real lack of um, lack of humility when you're so pretentious that you just want to focus on one thing because nothing else really matters. Um, so that's my general opinion about that. I'm sure it has some some sort of holes that one can sort of reconcile with those types of with one of those things. But I'll at least say, if someone does have a really good argument against me, it would be at least a real shame if we um, if we were to not at least attempt to do a holistic philosophy and fail than never to try it all and not okay. ever know. And exactly. this is, and and this in is... fact, I think you're right to say that this can be turned against, against the accuser, right? And so far as you'd say, you know, the person with ego is the one who's not willing to fail. The one who thinks that, you know, they'll get their paper published and they won't have tough objections, right? Right. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to real quick. Thank you, uh, Von uh, Gorsi. I think Gorsi. Hopefully I'm not mispronouncing that. If, uh, if I am, you can let me know. <laughs> uh, for subscribing. Thank you for subscribing. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay. So sorry for cutting you off, Grant. No, I mean, I, th I think I said pretty much all I needed to. Okay, okay. Um, and I also wanted to say one thing. This is precisely what I said was precisely square dab in the middle of Plato's philosophy when he was talking to Menno about not knowing things. So Menno's paradox is how 
you know, Meno basically was questioning on how we can know things, or I think actually Plato, or yeah, Socrates was questioning Meno on how we can know things. Um, well, I mean, in order to gain knowledge, one has to be aware of what they're looking for in order to try to acquire that knowledge. But how do they know what they're looking for if they've never come across that form of truth, right? So it bleeds us with two horns. Either the truth is out there and we'll never know how it looks like and we can never find it because how can we find something that we have no idea that looks looks like it? Or um, or we could have basically, uh, in, in which case we could have never started the inquiry. Uh, so actually, sorry, there, there isn't two horns. That's just basically the dilemma itself. It's just that you... It, you would have to know in some sort of way priorly be associated with that in order to look for it. Um, but then Socrates goes on to admitting, well, even though this aporia exists, it would still be better and we'd still be wiser and more honest with ourselves if we had tried to acquire truth and knowledge than never to have done that. Also, secondly, um, the problem with Sam Harris isn't that he's trying to be a generalist. The problem with Sam Harris is that he doesn't read any fucking literature at all in philosophy. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, you... Uh, what was the quote? It's not, that, like? yeah, it's not that he's a generalist, he's not good at it. And, and that he, you know, e eagerly and with no humility, for instance, dismisses the thought of people that he clearly hasn't seriously engaged with. I, I'm trying to find that quote um, by Sam Harris. That's just 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 horrific. Um, it was something about um, increases the amount of boredom in the world or something like that. Oh my god! Know? Yeah, terms like meta ethics and I don't remember what the other one was. Uh, uh, I'm trying. Let's see if I can find the, the quote. Uh, god, it might, I might not be able to at the at, at the moment. Uh, increases. The overall boredom in the world, yeah. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Might not be able to find it right now off the top of my head. He said, uh, I'm convinced that every appearance of terms like metaethics, deontology, non cognitivism, anti realism, emotivism, etc directly increases the amount of boredom in the universe. Right, right. He said, yeah, 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 that's it. And then this is his response to, quote, many of my critics fault me for not engaging directly with the academic literature on moral philosophy. It's like, okay, dude. This is just not basic, an answer. It's, it's another way of saying, yeah, I'm just not going to do it because I, it, you know, <laughs> it bores me, <laughs> even yeah. though there might potentially be a, a, you know, a drastic amount of issues that I'm not even aware of. And, and that ends up being the case, right? If you want to be a generalist, you're going to have to generally do some yeah. reading within um, these yeah. areas. Okay, so let's look at some other questions here. Um just before that last question that I read, it someone asked, "Experience is essential to consciousness," and that that would I would say that that's absolutely correct. There's no such thing as disembodied consciousness. These um, imagine form without content, right? Um, what it would what it would it mean to have an experience, or even sorry, what would it mean to have a consciousness if the consciousness wasn't about anything, uh, right? There, so I'm somehow somehow divorced from the rest of the world, I wouldn't have any sense of particularity about who I am, nothing to talk about who I am. It, it's a sort of empty set, right? So experience is essential to consciousness, and consciousness is, is essential to experience. And so there's a sort of dynamic repertoire of the two working, just as is there a dynamic repertoire within all of Kant to say that we have to have pure concepts of understanding associated with sensible intuitions. There's always a spontaneity and reciprocity to uh, receptivity. So. I think there is something like this, uh, at least in concept, or at least, uh, uh, you know, I think this is what Kant means by homonumenon, or uh, the noumenal self, or the transcendental self, um, which really is just nothing right and this is this starts the whole i think literature on nothing really 
and then later there's this starts the literature on consciousness as negation uh where we have someone like sartre as being nothingness or sterner even has a conception of subjectivity as the creative nothing uh you know he says like a that the transcendental subject of thoughts equals x i'm trying to remember the quote is something about which i can have even the least concept and Stoner says something like um that i am not a thought uh that thoughts are within me or something like that a thought world i think is also this conception yeah where I mean, it's pure have... it's pure potentiality right but it's not uh nothing with content right I... but then again it's nothing it's nothing in the world it's nothing to us if it doesn't already the idea of pure potentiality is just i i think such an arcane thought i it's uh, it's always yeah it's, it seems really inaccurate i mean it's been re in, i mean even inaccurate since aristotle i mean you, you have the idea of potency and act in aristotle but potency never comes alone it's always with act so you have to have something that exists in order for it to be potent with something else um even freud anti-theist that he was acknowledged the influence of unconscious and subconscious aspects of our natures um that is why you cannot escape the influence of the wickedness of the human heart freud just put it in the mind quoth kant no straight thing was ever curved hewn rom the crooked wicked timber of humanity he means from carved from the crooked timber of humanity oh ah, okay from the crooked timber of humanity yeah, okay this is just no understanding of kant you found a quote online i mean i mean it seems to me like you just found a quote online with that because it, it makes sense in a particular context but not in the whole and it doesn't make sense as evidencing a claim of inescapability of the influences of the influence of wickedness yeah i think a simple solution to this would be that human beings rational i mean the rational agency or the rational autonomy or the, the practical reason itself can straighten the crooked and wicked timber of our humanity uh, probably associated with kant right after he said something like that and right probably before although i can't remember where that quote comes from um, yeah, I actually wanted to ask you a similar subject in the same vein. Is idealism right that you can't actually observe anything since all your observations come through your senses and there's no way to verify that your senses are accurate because you have nothing to compare your personal sense data against? Since the only way to verify sense data is with your senses, that's, that's, that's um, a completely inaccurate portrayal of German idealism. Um, beginning with the idea that German idealists all rejected sense data um all rejected sense data I, I mean i guess kant didn't reject sense data in in one sense that there there seems to be some sort of non-conceptual content before the mind structures it with the pure concepts of understanding but there's a huge mistake from people who haven't read kant to think that observations or experiences or representations means that we can never say anything about the world so what he's saying isn't that we can't get at the world whatsoever the noumenon isn't the world in itself as it truly is the noumenon is the way in which the world is outside of the way that we have certain types of epistemic conditions to structure it as so it's not that we don't see the world at all we are seeing one aspect of it, the phenomenal aspect of it, and that's truly how, in some sense, the world is. That's just not the entire story, right? In the same sense that, and I've offered this analogy before, but John thinks it's a little bit um, inaccurate, well, it's slightly inaccurate, but good for the, the purpose of this. In the same sense that when a cat sees a computer, obviously it's not going to understand what the hell a computer really is, but it'll still be able to see the perceptual aspects of a laptop and know it's, you know, how it's shaped and presumably knows something about its structure when it stands on it and decides to balance against it. Does that mean that just because they only see one thousandth of what we know about the uh, computer, that they don't see the computer at all in any sort of meaningful sense? No, they just see less of the approximation of what it means for a computer to be a computer. 
in the same sense that Kant is basically saying there are sort of epistemic limitations of a human being that they can see the world in itself. Uh, sorry, uh, the world as the as the dingus and dish. Um, so, would you like to comment on that, Grant? I actually got to get out of here now, unfortunately. I've got to get going. Um, you got to get going? I do. Okay. Um, I enjoyed being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. It was a fun time. Good conversation. All right, Grant. Well, thank you for coming on, man. Uh, you take care if you got to go right now. Uh, we'll definitely have a conversation sometime in the future, all right? Sounds good, man. All right, have a good one. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, so I'm going to continue asking, answering some questions here since we're not at the two-hour point yet, although we're almost there. Um, so that's that's the sort of answer that I, I would I would give against that atomic leech. It's is that um, idealism is a very complicated position. Kantian idealism is even a more complicated idealistic position that does not subscribe to that thesis. And then the German idealists are basically realists in one sense, and then they're saying that the world is intelligible and that there is actually no distinction between our experiences and how the world is. That's not to say that. That's because the world is consistent of experiences that are all consistent within our mind. It's because our experiences are such that they couldn't exist without a world, our world dependent, and that experiences are full of content that's already of the world, which is intelligible and, given, and giving us its intelligible structure. Um, the opposite of that is that the world does not have an intelligible structure and that we make it intelligible which is then going to rise the question of how do we make the world that is unintelligible intelligible? Um, and this, is, this is a huge question uh, of which many philosophers would have their own opinion on. Uh, so yeah, let's move on to some other questions. Uh, da, da, da. I can totally see that, my point, but yes, Jesus was very humble. If Jesus had strong feelings, I know that Nietzsche may be Russell. A lot of YouTube personalities just make super vague statements with buzzwords that make them sound credible. But when people point out they aren't or try to criticize or try criticisms of the statements, they can use the vagueness as a way to hand wave that criticism. I think that's pretty true. Um, this reminds me of, of one of my friends is showing me this video, and this is always this is always so funny. Um, let me see if I can find the video of Tom Jump talking about nonsense. Uh, da, da, da. Oh no. This is this is what happens when people when people don't know what they're talking about and start talking about things that they don't know what they're talking about is that they say things like this know what you're talking about and it and and it and it bums me out because it seems like these notions are pretty fundamental to your view and yet I don't have a clue what you're saying are you familiar with Kant's phenomenal numinal distinction uh, you know, asking a philosophy professor if you're familiar with the phenomenal noumenal distinction by Kant. I am, but why don't you explain it to me? All right, so the noumenal is the way reality really is, and the phenomenal is our appearance of reality, or the, the model of reality constructed as far as we can tell. Yeah, that's just nothing. I mean, if you had you read, you know, a few pages of Kant, it has absolutely nothing to do with how Kant cashes out the noumenal phenomenal distinction. Um, you know, people like Tom Jump will say these types of things and then not actually have read any philosophy, uh, history of philosophy. Uh, there's another portion of it, I'm wondering if I can find it, of where he brings out something even... Empirical basis. So, I mean, miracles, magic, mythical creatures, the paranormal, supernatural, UFOs, no amount of historical testimony will justify any of those things. <laughs> I mean, that was just the that was just the greatest reaction, and of course, you know, capturing Christianity. I forgot his name, unfortunately, is just kind of also smirking in the background right there. Um, so what's basically going on right here is that um, 
Tom Jump is not accepting testimonial evidence as actual evidence um, for the basis of her beliefs. Um, so when does he say this is okay? He says it's okay in certain types of conditions that would benefit him. Not okay in other types of uh, conditions where it wouldn't benefit him. Of course, when does that happen? Exactly when we have Christian historical evidence from the apostles, right? So anything that the apostles say um, that has anything to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, et cetera, et cetera, any sort of acts of miracles, those can't possibly be right by testimonial standards. Um, but they can be right for anything else, like any sort of historical testimonial evidence can count as historical evidence, except when he wants it to, and he has no actual um, non-arbitrary standard for, for that. And it's funny. Um, Harris is the definition of a hack. He, uh, in my opinion, he literally thinks he's always right. Um, that, that this is the sort of experience that I have with viewing Sam Harris is that he also pontificates about things that he doesn't have any sort of clue, any fucking clue about. Um, Jordan Peterson also comes into mind, of course, uh, that nothing might be the cop. Uh, Let's see if there are any, any more questions. It's kind of horrifying that the two most famous philosophy people alive today are Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. You know, there's a certain sense of where they're the most famous because they're good rhetoricians. They, they, they have sentences or phrases that sound very clean and very deep. Um, Danette calls these deepities. Um, so things that aren't actually deep, but sound deep and, you know, <laughs> that will, that will of course, uh, come often from them. And it turns out if you actually look at any sort of literature associated with anything that they're talking about, um, ends up being completely wrong. I mean, even, and the unfortunate thing about Sam Harris, as opposed to Jordan Peterson, is that even the type of, um, work that he did as a graduate, you know, when he did his neuroscience degree, is highly controversial and not respected as well. Whereas Jordan Peterson, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's something, something in his psychology that can be worth some merit. Although that Jungianism or Jung, um, I'm really suspicious and skeptical of it. Has anything, anything interesting, anything actually substantive in there? Um, watch Sadler on YouTube. I also watch Sadler on YouTube occasionally. I, I really, been, I really enjoy watching Sadler. Um, although his interpretations of Hegel were a little bit, uh, difficult to sometimes comprehend. It seems as though he wanted to do an entire, and he's still doing an entire rundown of the phenomenology of spirit. But, <clears throat> you know, I wouldn't watch those YouTube videos over, say, reading a, just a, a really good guide on the phenomenology of spirit myself, even though I'm sure Sattler's brilliant. Um, yeah, the question is how Berkeley ideal, uh, Berklinian idealism was explained to me, so thanks for clearing that up. Uh, but yeah, th there's a distinction between Berkeleyan idealism and, and any other form of idealism within the German tradition, so... Berkeley's idealism, and I've explained this before in the stream, is just the idea that, yeah, literally things do only exist as uh, as ideas within minds. Since Berkeley did hold on to the thesis that only minds and spirits exist, and sorry, only ideas and spirits exist and spirits are our minds. Um, however, things obviously don't stop existing when we stop perceiving them because, you know, Everything will always be perceived by, by God. Um, and that's the only thing that can save Barclay's philosophy, so he has to provide a proof for God. Of course, one might be tempted to say something like, there's no more proof of God than there is proof of an external world of any sort. Uh, Zizek, question mark. I guess the question is asking whether I respect Zizek. Uh, 
or whether I think that he's a popularizer who doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't think the same way as Zizek. I think Zizek actually, as far as I know, does uh, pretty good scholarship on various German idealists. I haven't particularly read his work myself because I think and this is another thing that I've said before in the stream that I think that there's just. Of course, I can't prematurely say this without reading a lot of Zizek or reading any of Zizek, but. Um, from what I do here, like the, the scholarship on Hegel would be better and scholarship on Kant would be better somewhere else. I don't know about Lacan, since those are his two children. The fact that Jordan Peterson recommends that one book all the time by Hicks is telling that he's lack of his lack of knowledge in philosophy and its history. Yeah. Um so you're referring to the uh, postmodern book by Stephen Hicks, and it's really, it's just really bad. It's really bad. Um, let me see if I can find a picture of one page from Stephen Hicks on my computer. I know I have it here somewhere. Um, so in case you guys aren't familiar with Jordan Peterson and Stephen Hicks and all that, um, Jordan Peterson ha basically recommends this book, right, by... Um, by Stephen Hicks on postmodernism and it's meant to refute the postmodernists and let me offer you one diagram from what Stephen Hicks really believes is what I titled it this is what Stephen Hicks really believes and this is really a page from Stephen Hicks's book on postmodernism and this was actually also brought up, I think, on Cuck Philosophy, if you guys ever watched that YouTube series. So these are various things, or various types of uh, subsets of philosophical categories, right? And then the historical era of which they all occur in. So the pre-moderns, moderns, and post-moderns, and what they believe in, right? So, I mean, like, look at the pre-moderns. They believed in realism and supernaturalism. Uh, they believed in mysticism and or faith. And uh, the human nature was original sin and subject to God's will. Ethics was a type of collectivism. They all subscribed to a form of feudalism. This is the medieval age. Like the first one, if it's already not, already not um, baffling, or I, I should say the epistemology is sort of baffling, is the idea that uh, the, the pre-moderns or the medieval philosophers, the scholastics, thought that everything was based upon mysticism and faith. And that's just so egregious. It's just incredibly egregious. It's such bad scholarship. Or the moderns believed in realism and naturalism. It just which, which moderns? I mean, like, are, you, are we talking about Berkeley? He's a modernist. Are we talking about Kant? I mean, you can consider that a form of modernism. Maybe, maybe a little bit after modernism. But they didn't. They weren't realists. <laughs> um, they believed in objectivism and experience and reason. Um, but the idea that the epistemology of the moderns as not believing in objectivity and reason and experiences is even more baffling to me that this one would be in some way secluded to this. Or, you know, I mean, let's see what else. I'm going to zoom this out a little bit in case you guys don't see it. Well, um, you know, human nature, tabula rasa, and autonomy who besides John Locke would believe in the tabula rasa? Ethics is a form of individualism, but that's, I, I don't understand. I mean, like, we, we can't, if Hegel would fit, fit under the modern mark, he's the, he's the class A example of collectivism. Liberal capitalism as the basis of any sort of modern thinker's political or economical standard. Um... I mean, and then let's look at postmodernism. Okay, we can grant maybe that a majority of them are anti-realists. So what? There's a lot of other contemporary people who are anti-realists, especially within the sciences. Their epistemology isn't social subjectivism. And their view of human nature might be a form of social conventionalism, but probably not in the way that Stephen Hicks thinks. And sure as hell, postmodernists aren't fucking socialists because postmodernism is diametrically opposed to socialism and communism. They don't believe in a foundation, and the socialists, or particularly Marxists, do.
They're foundationalists. They think that the material conditions are going to set forth every other thing. Whereas postmodernists don't believe in material conditions as basically setting forth every other thing. They're going to say that there is no sort of foundational thesis for why things are going on in the social atmosphere, in the political economical atmosphere that they do in the way that they do. Because there is no foundational basis because they're not foundationalists. They think that the world is basically constructed out of uh, uh, signs and signifiers. Anyways, yeah, so yeah, a little bit of a, a tan tangent on Stephen Hicks and how incredibly dumb he is. Um, God existing is simply without the bounds of science, I'd say, demarcation, um, but people, but it makes people post more time. I've seen that video, uh, I've seen a video about that, and how do people, how do people like this get to write books or spread knowledge? Well, the good thing about Stephen Hicks is that I think that that book is self-published. I don't think any publisher actually uh, accepted that. Um, I mean, you know, notice that it's not, you know, it's not Notre Dame or Oxford or Princeton Press. Um, this is one thing that you guys should keep in mind two things whenever you're reading a philosophy book one make sure that it's a respectable press and that it's not self-published self-published books and philosophy are generally crap secondly make sure that the word doctor isn't right or or m or phd isn't anywhere in that name <laughs> um anyone who's recognized or anyone worth any salt at all will not Put a PhD or an MD right next to their name in order to pull people in unless they're trying to sell something to you. They're already going to be recognized enough to where they don't need to have some sort of letters of recommendation next to their name. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't really even matter if you have a PhD next to your name because you can get a PhD from various types of institutes that don't really matter. Um, so check the publisher, check the press. Uh, da, da, da. Um, okay, I don't want to go too far off the subject, but is there any real substantive difference between modernism and postmodernism? Yeah, but that that's just that's going to be you know you can cash this out in terms of I think sociological or anthropological, anthropo uh, yeah, probably sociological differences when we study like societies and the types of values that they have. Um, so a sort of postmodern condition might be one that's subject to um, not setting forth certain types of foundational standards, right? They'd be sort of anti-foundationalists. So there I sort of do agree with, you know, by luck maybe, uh, Jordan Peterson. But I mean, in order to get a real substantial difference between modernism and postmodernism and the sort of general defined way of their general, the general incredulity, incredulity of postmodernism towards meta narratives would require a lot more, uh, would require much more description, much more nuance than I'm willing to give right now. Someone in the chat was laughing at the connection between postmodern and philosophy and anti-realism. Yeah. Not 100% sure about the God thing, but I think it's fair to say in many ways. Um, who besides John Locke would believe in the tabula rasa? Mary uh, Wollstonecraft, for starters, she wrote most famous work vindicating women's rights on the idea that their minds were just as blank and therefore as receptive as, as and capable as men's. Yeah, so... I should correct myself. I don't. I'm not denying that other people didn't believe in the tabula rasa. Obviously, other people believed in the tabula rasa, but the idea that all moderns believed in the tabula rasa, or that this was like the the go-to preferred view of human nature uh, during modernity, seems to be so dead wrong that you'd have to you'd have to have not read anything in order to make that assessment. 
Anyways, guys, it has been two hours since we have began our conversation. And now it is time to wish you all farewell. Uh, I will answer one last question from Clam, and then I will head out. Wish you all the best. And the last question is, do you have many Christian philosopher duders in your server? I just started looking at your theology channel the other day. We have a few Christians in the server. However, most of the people within the server are not Christians. One of the types of guests that I plan on having on here is a Thomistic Catholic. He said he might, he might uh, have a dialogue that he needs to prepare, but I asked him about a month ago or so, so he might have prepared by now. So we'll see if he's down to talk next Tuesday at 2 p.m. That is when we'll... That's when we'll uh, have another stream, guys. So join us there with more philosophy, 24-7, 24-7 philosophy with yours truly, Marty. That's what we do every day, 24-7. We're going to be boxing and shipping good old boxes of philosophy out every day, every day, every day with philosophy. Thanks for those guys. Uh, thanks, thank you guys for those two people right here that subscribed today. Thank you again. Please like and subscribe. Follow us at the YouTube channel as well. Uh, the, the YouTube link should be right here at the end, ending screen. Uh, all of our videos, at least any of the really important dialogues, are now posted on the, on the YouTube channel.